Kia ora koutou. Welcome to Shared Lunch, brought to you by Sharesies with Business Desk. Sharesies is a wealth development platform whose purpose is to create financial empowerment for everyone. My name is Dan Brunskill. I'm a markets reporter at Business Desk. For those of you who are new to Shared Lunch, we do these every Thursday at lunchtime, alternating between an interview with a company leader and, and sort of an industry deep dive, which is what we're doing this week. Uh, Business Desk has a special offer for shares as investors. If you use the promo code SHAREDLUNCH100, you'll get $100 off an annual subscription to Business Desk, which is usually $249, including GST. This offer only applies to new Business Desk subscribers and can only be used once per subscriber, and it can't be used with any other discounts. Before we get started, we just need to show you some important information. Investing involves risk. You might lose the money you start with. We recommend talking to a licensed financial advisor. We also recommend reading product disclosure documents before deciding to invest. Everything you're about to see and hear is current at the time of recording. Also, just a quick reminder, if you have any questions for our guest, you can submit them in the ask a question button, which you will find down below. Don't leave your questions in the discussion area as, uh, as I will miss them. They're, they're likely to get missed. Um, but please do ask questions. Uh, we love, that's kind of what we're here for. I can ask questions all day, but we want to hear yours. Um, please be kind and respectful towards both our guest and your fellow viewers. Otherwise, we will remove you from the webinar. So today we're joined by Greg Cross, who is the co-founder and chief business officer of Soul Machines. Welcome, Greg. Hey, thanks, Dan. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's absolute, absolute pleasure. Um, so last year, one of the world's biggest companies, one we all know, Facebook, um, pivoted and rebranded to put its focus on what they're calling, what we're all calling the metaverse. Um, and we're actually going to run a clip of what Mark Zuckerberg thinks the metaverse will look like. Whoa, we're floating in space? Uh -huh. Who made this place? It's <laughs> awesome. Right? It's from a crater I met in LA. Uh, this place is amazing. <laughs> Boz, is that you? Of course it's me. You know I had to be the robot, man. I thought I was supposed to be the robot. <laughs> So a huge amount of big global brands, not just Facebook, but Microsoft and NVIDIA have made some mention of the metaverse and their long-term strategy. It's becoming a very hot topic, but Soul Machines has been thinking about this for a very long time, and Greg has agreed to dive into some of the detail and, and talk through it with us. So thanks for that. Um, let's start with Soul Machines. What is Soul Machines? What do you do, and, and how does it fit into the metaverse writ yeah. large? Yep, cool. Um, great, great plus place to start. So, um, Soul Machines is a couple of things. So, you know, on on one hand, you know, so we are a, I mean, we're a New Zealand company. We are a spin out um, of a deep research, deep tech research project at the uni that started at the University of Auckland back in 2012 uh, by my co-founder um, here, Dr. Mark Sager, who you know is an award winning. Uh, animator, um, academic researcher, uh, and so it's really his incredible science that has helped us create our technology. So part of what we do is this incredible deep tech research, which enables us to think about the future of, of, and the way in which digital people, CGI characters, will be animated in the metaverse. And you know, way back in 2012, Mark was already thinking about how, you know, animation might go past the paradigm that has been developed um, for the incredible animations that we see in the in the movie industry and the games industry. You know, industries he won um, he won Oscars and literally for his work on movies like the like like Avatar and, and King Kong. Mm -hmm. So. A lot, what we've started with in terms of the research is a, a deep tech research project at the University of Auckland looking at how we autonomously animate digital characters. And to give you an idea, a simple, you know, what does autonomous animation mean? Well, you know, what we've seen, you know, in terms of animation today, you know, there's, there's kind of two or three types of animation. So one type of animation is what we, we, we call human powered or human controlled animation. So that's what the movie industry, you know, uses, you know, you know um, to um, human actors who act a role, motion capture cameras. We've all seen sort of the, the, the technology that was used for the Lord of the Rings and 
um, and, and some of these types of things where, you know, we actors act the role, the data gets captured and played back on the CGI character. Um, you know, what Mark Zuckerberg showed when he launched Meta last year was him live acting and bringing his character to life in a live way. So this, that's one form of animation. Our form of animation is just like this. Autonomous animation is what we're doing here today. My brain is animating me. And every, you know, Dan, your brain's animating you and everybody who's listening will be hearing what I say, um, how I say it. They will have feelings about that. They will be thinking about that. And that's their brain animating them. And that's the concept of autonomous animation. And as we head into a more and more digital world, you know, there is obviously huge utility in the way, you know, for the use of autonomous animation as it applies to the digital characters that represent us or our companies, you know, in the metaverse. I mean, mm -hmm. of course, there's utility in, in the way Mark Zuckerberg imagines it. But if Mark's not there, if Mark's not standing in front of his camera bringing his avatar to life, it's lifeless. It's dead. Um, whereas, you know, I can create um, digital salespeople for, for your organization, digital um, customer service agents, digital brand influencers who you know, are infinitely scalable, work 24 by 7, and can do amazing stuff for your organization when you're not there. So hopefully that gives everybody a bit of a flavor as to how we think about the metaverse and who we are as a company. Yeah. So fundamentally what you make are a sort of autonomous digital people that can fill various metaverse labor roles, like, um, as you say, being an influencer or a sales agent um, that have the feeling of being a human but are just an AI digital animated creation. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. That's interesting. So then we probably want to dive into what the metaverse actually is. And, and I guess, are we in the metaverse right now? What, what exactly is the metaverse? Can we unpick that a little bit? Yeah. Um, yeah, these are all you know, really, um, really good questions. And, and, and you know, look, questions we're only just beginning to start to uh, start to understand. And, and you know, I mean, I, it, could, it could be years before we have, a, uh, you know, a, an accurate definition of, of the, you know, what exactly the metaverse is. You know, I mean, I like to, you know, the way I think about the metaverse is, you know, I mean, and, and you know, we we all talked about the world, you know, the, the concepts of digital transformation, um, uh, and the concepts of the fourth industrial revolution. So if we if we wind our clocks back and we cast our minds back to to 2019, we spent a lot of time talking about some of these, con you know, you know, big corporates, you know, all over the world were talking about digital transformation, and and we were talking about the fourth industrial revolution. The robots are coming. They're going to steal our jobs. They're going to rule over us. Um, and then COVID came along, and and we stopped talking about it. Um, and it all of us, it just happened, you know. So you know what what's happened over the last two years is that as the world we live in, you know, the way we interact with each other, the way we do business with e each other, is infinitely more digital. You know, digital mm -hmm. platforms are incredibly important to the way in which we. We do this, and you know, obviously, we're coming. By, you know, we're we're coming together. You guys are listening to me, and we're you know, Dan, you and I, we have doing this interview via a digital platform. You know, mm -hmm. you know, two years ago, we'd have all probably got together in a, in, in a hall somewhere and and done it, you know, in, in real time. But so the world's more digital, um, and there are you know, and, and the way I think of the metaverse is there are different types of digital worlds. So I mean, I'm I'm a simple guy, so I tend to like sim simple definitions. So, you know, the digital world that we have today, the one we carry around in our pocket and we access, you know, um, using our smartphone, you know, that's a 2D digital world. It's a flat screen mm -hmm. digital world. Um, the way I think about the metaverse um, is, it, you know, and a sim simple definition, it, it's a digital world, but it's a 3D digital world. Um, you know, it's, 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 um, you know, so, I mean, so it's so simply, you know, you know and, and I think this is, I mean, for me, that's really important that we, we think about this transition from a 2D digital world to a 3D digital world, you know, um, because I think that transition and, you know, trying to think only about the 3D digital world or the metaverse in isolation is, is the wrong way to start. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, so at, at one level, uh, the internet 1.0, whatever we're in now, is 2D. 
the metaverse is whatever 3D world comes after it. But it will be squishy in between while we transition because obviously we don't all have 3D devices. Very few of us have Oculus headsets. We mostly just have our iPhone and that will be how we engage with the metaverse at first and there'll be a transition period. Yeah. That's kind of what you're saying. Well, I, mean, I, I, I define it a little bit differently to that because you know, mm -hmm. the metaverse doesn't necessarily you know, have to come after the internet. You know, right. I mean, the internet, the, the 2D digital worlds, you know, and my, you know, the way I think about it, I mean, certainly for, you know, at least the foreseeable future, you know, the, the 2D digital worlds, you know, uh, you know, will, you know, I mean, they're incredibly ubiquitous already. And we've, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, as companies, as, as organizations, as, as uh, even as consumers, we've invested a lot of money and time in, in, the, in the current digital worlds and the way in which we use them today. So I don't think that goes away. And, and okay. you know, and we all of a sudden, we do everything in a 3D world. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I'll, if I take a simple example, um, a really simple example, um, you know, if we want to buy our groceries, you know, um, you know, do we want to be able to go on to an, you know, a 2D e-commerce website and say, you know, here's my grocery list from last week. I'm just, I'm buying the same things. I'm really boring. I eat the same things every week. So, you know, I go do that. It's a super efficient way to use the current internet and e-commerce infrastructure we have. You know, and then we think about the metaverse and we, we've got this immersive experience where we can actually go have an adventure in a, in a you know, in a digital supermarket in America from, you know, from my, you know, my home office in Auckland, and I can wander around and see what different brands they want. That's a different type of experience. That's me as a consumer, you know, looking to achieve something completely different. You know, one's a transaction, you know, which I just want to be efficient. And the other is, I want to go on a bit of an adventure in, in, an, in a US supermarket. Well, go figure. I mean, yeah, so, you know, I, I see those two things, uh, you know, as being, you know, needing to be really, really tightly coupled and integrated. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So not the metaverse replacing our entire real lives or the entire digital world, um, but just being another another supplementary part of it. Yeah, um, it's a seamless experience. It's something we as consumers should be able to move, you know, um, you move really seamlessly between. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So, so when you think about who are the big key players that are, sort of building the metaverse who who do you look at as being the most important players in the industry right now oh yeah i mean that's an almost an impossible question to <laughs> to answer at this stage i mean yeah i mean I, I mean when i think about where the metaverse is today and and you know this ages me and dates me um and you know and and, and this is sort of only you know the early you know not not even at, a, at an early point in my career but you know, i mean i lived through the dot-com era you know from the yeah. hype of the late 90s you know you know through to the through the dot-com crash and you know and in some ways you know i mean i'm a, you know, I'm, a, I'm a historian and i've been around long enough to to understand that in life history often repeats itself so i mean a lot of what we're seeing and hearing about the metaverse you know today um you know sounds an awful lot a, 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 of some of the hysteria and hype that we had back in the late 90s about uh, about the internet um so you know there are, i mean so you know today i mean look there is a lot of focus you know there are you know um, early stage technology companies, startup companies like Soul Machines. There are big companies like Meta and Microsoft and the big games companies and the big gaming platforms and tool vendors, all of whom who are making, all of us are making significant investments um, in the metaverse today. But, you know, which of us, you know, where the key players will come from, you know, um, you know, it's really, really too too early to tell. I mean, there are some certainly some mm -hmm. some key things where we can say, you know, these could be could be key components, you know, you know, of the metaverse. You know, the I mean, if you think of the the unities and the epics, the guys that provide the you know the the tools that create digital worlds for for, for games and you know even AR and VR experiences today, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you you have to imagine that those types of tools are going to be really, really important. Um, you know, you know, 
GPU companies, you know, GPU chip companies like NVIDIA who, you know, provide the graphics rendering in the cloud and, and for the devices. Yeah, that, is that going to be important? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it, it's really early days. I mean, I, I mean, if I, you know, just go on for a little bit longer, um, mm -hmm. you know, one of the stories I like to tell about this is, you know, if you go back to the, you know, the dot-com era and the bubble burst and, so many of the early internet companies just went bust. You know, they all, yep. you know, they went away. I mean, you know, you know, all, all the whole first wave of e-commerce, you know, stores that got built, the build it and we will, they will come approach. It all disappeared. Um, you know, the wall garden approach that, you know, many companies had taken to the internet was completely irrelevant. I mean, I, you know, I did a short stint at Microsoft in the late nineties and, you know, and Microsoft, you know, their initial internet strategy was to build a walled garden. I don't know how many telcos around the world tried to build walled gardens, um, yeah. you know, internet walled gardens. So, you know, all of that went away. Um, but there was one company, and I remember, you know, in 2001, there was one company where everybody was taking bets, you know, how long will it be before this company goes bust? How long will it be before they run out of money and, and go chapter 11? And that company Michael was Amazon. Answer. You know, mm -hmm. in those days, it was a bookstore, you know, an internet online bookstore. And here we are 20 years later, you know, and, uh, you know, when just about everybody in the world was ab absolutely sure Amazon and Jeff Bezos would disappear and be irrelevant um, in the dot-com bubble burst, you know, 20 years later, um, you know, they're one of the, the most, um, you know, important tech companies, you know, one of the most important retailers on the planet. And and the reason I like to tell that story is I think there's one really important fact here um, that, 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 that I'm very thoughtful about as I think about our metaverse strategy is, you know, the reason, you know, one of the reasons why Amazon survived and prospered is, you know, Jeff Bezos is legendary for his relentless focus on customer experience. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you know, as you know, companies out there, you know, people who are listening, think about opportunities for them and their organization or, or creating a business for the metaverse. You know, you know, I think that's a really, really important message everybody can, can think about. You know, how are we going to deliver and create amazing customer experiences using this mm -hmm. technology? Yeah, because so I think that's the thing, eh? the metaverse won't kick off just because it's the metaverse and people are excited about it. It actually has to bring some sort of tangible value benefit to the consumer um, that they're willing to get into. And I think a lot of the products are still in their infancy and maybe not yet bringing that much value. And, and you sort of saw a similar thing happen in the 90s when all the internet dot coms took off that's what you're talking about there where everyone made a website everyone made some sort of internet company and they just weren't providing enough there weren't enough consumers there they weren't providing a good enough experience for the consumers and so much of it fell over and then it was sort of the second round that sort of delivered the actual revolution we, we could sort of be in a similar place with yeah. metaverse I mean, type products yeah well you know if you think about second and third round i mean if you look at the <clears throat> excuse me if you look at the technology stack and, and the infrastructure that now supports you know um, the internet or the digital world as we we know it today i mean you know in 2001 you know the smartphone you know which is the device the access device of choice was still six years away you know the mm -hmm. first smartphone was still six years away in 2001 so you know i mean you know so as a you know i mean even as a the hardware enablement platform you know for the internet you know even you know you know, so look, I mean, you know, we've we've seen the infrastructure of the current digital worlds literally develop not just over one decade, but two decades now. So, you know, I, you know, this is going to be, you know, a series of, you know, iterations and different mm -hmm. versions. Greg, in terms of those iterations and versions, what sort of technology breakthroughs do we need to have to get to a world where, where there's much more metaverse penetration, where there's much more metaverse stuff happening? Do we have the technology for it now, or are we still in a phase where we've got to be building and, and sort of distributing the tech to make it happen? Um, look, I think a lot of the components, you know, um, you know, clearly are, you know, are, you know, are emerging at, the, at the, this point in time. You know, we're seeing... You know, I mean, you know, we're, we're seeing lots of companies um, showcase, you know, interesting, you know, like Meta showcase really, really interesting technologies about the, you know, the future, the, the way in which we might socialize with our friends in the network. And that, you know, as, as we saw in that clip that, 
you know, that you showed right at the outset. So, you know, we're starting, you know, we're, you know, we're seeing, you know, NVIDIA at their recent conference a couple of weeks ago. I mean, they showed some different visions out, you know, of that. And, and we're certainly showing out, you know, as Soul Machines as a, as a company that deals largely with big enterprise brands, we're starting to show, you know, some of our customers the way we think that we can create customer experiences for them in the future. So look, it's, it, you know, a lot of the component parts are there. They're at different stages of maturity. I mean, um, you know, some of the core platform components. So, you know, you know, Metaverse and Web3 are two different things, you know, but each of them will enable the other as they evolve. And, that, and they're both, you know, at, at, you know, in the early stages of their evolution as well at the moment. So, you yeah. know, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot there. But, and, but then we, we then you can go and think about, well, you know, how many of us, you know, I mean, here's, you know, how many of us own headsets, you know? I mean, how, how many mm -hmm. of us have, have our goggles and, uh, you know, at, at home and use them? And because, you know, I mean, despite the fact that, you know, AR and VR headsets have been talked about for, you know, 10 years now, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, it's still not a main, it's still not mainstream hardware. I mean, it's not nowhere near. You know, it hasn't even got close to the smartphone. You know, or even a fraction of the smartphone market. So, you know, you know. So one of the big questions is, you know, what will the hardware form factors of the, mm -hmm. you know, um, will develop? How will the, you know, the sensors and the technologies that you know we might integrate into our offices and our home to to make the you know the metaverse experience more immersive you know if you think of i mean if you go back 10 years ago you know how many how many of us had you know you know large format screen televisions with surround sound speaker systems and yeah you know, i mean so these were you know some of the the ways in which consumer technology is involved to enable us to to get you know an incredibly rich you know movie theater light experience in our own home, so you know you know some of these are are things that are going to have to you know, evolve for the metaverse as well. So you know there's the whole hardware and the consumer hardware component part of it that you know we're still you know when will you know you know the hololenses and the the oculuses and the magic leaps of this world you know deliver you know a, a, a device that's so compelling that we'll all want to own one um, in the same way that we have a smartphone today because hmm. that still hasn't happened yet we are still engaging with the world in 2d the digital world in, in 2d primarily yep. even 3d movies have become less popular yeah um, i don't so i mean i don't don't think televisions even support 3d anymore they tried, but again, it just was. Yeah, there. yeah. I mean, it, it comes down again. It'll come down to content um, uh, and and people who want to participate in you know in that type of experience. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it was. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I can remember. You know, you know, I buy a, I buy a new TV every time there's a rugby world cup coming up. So that's how I justify okay, good, my good. my purchase of a, a bigger and larger television every four years. And and so the TV before last was a 3D. Um, uh, experience and I can remember the only time I ever you know I, I went on you know I went and you know bought the Avatar D DVD because that was recorded in 3D and I put on my glasses and watched the movie a super cool experience I only ever did it once mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah you know yeah four years later you know when I when I bought my last my my current television you know they don't support 3D anymore. They don't do 3D television. So I was trying to sell you an 8K television rather than a 4K television. But yeah. Yeah. So this technology doesn't always move in a straight line. I mean, it's the same thing with the electric car. We invented the electric car years and years and years. You know, I, I know exactly, but almost as long as there have been cars, there have been electric cars. And it's only recently that they've suddenly become mainstream and are sort of taking over the, the combustion engine. So these things can take a long time to play out. Um, maybe maybe one last question before we jump to listener questions. So fire through your questions, listeners. Um, the, the, obviously, the metaverse and crypto are, are very interconnected. People talk about them um, almost as one and the same. Why are they so interconnected and do they have to be? Do you have to have crypto to do the metaverse? Can you do a non-crypto metaverse? Why are they thought of as being so interlinked? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I mean, I, mean, I, I you know, I guess the simple answer is they thought of being, you know, interlinked as they, you know, are, are they're both new technologies and new technology words and phrases and marketing slogans that have emerged at roughly the mm -hmm. same time. So, you know, for, you know, so by nature, you know, often they are confused as, 
as the same technologies or you know or, or one and the same you know i mean they but they they but each of them will enable the other with that with without a doubt i mean you know um you know we are you know more and more you know people you know if you think of the you know the 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 group of consumers we, we 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 all often refer to as the digital natives you know they're early adopters of digital currencies they you know they, they use digital currencies to buy stuff in the digital world you know and you know increasingly you know you know when you go into e-commerce websites you can pay using you know one of the you know one of the existing banking systems or you can pay using cryptocurrency so mm -hmm. um but you know the, the 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 for me the really interesting area of web3 and where it will you know web3 and, and and the broader concepts of web3 not just you know uh, you know block you know not just cryptocurrency and blockchain but the broader concepts of web3 where they become really really important um you know as we sort of see this you know next you know major iteration of technology platform you know is the way in which we protect we choose to protect and share data and privacy you know in 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 the, in the metaverse so you know we you know i, I think that's going to be an enormously important way um you yeah. know um another example of this type of tech you know the, the you know, sort of the cryptocurrency web3 stuff that we've seen and then that burst this burst into consciousness you know, last year as well, along with the metaverse, was NFTs. You know, so mm -hmm. you know, how do we think about NFTs? You know, we, you know, you know, many of us, you know, many of us are scratching our heads and say, well, you know, what, you know, why do, why are people paying so much money for a, you know, what effectively is just a, you know, I mean, I, you know, if I'm a cynic, mm -hmm. is a JPEG of a an ape or a or a bunny or you know or mm -hmm. you know any other, you know. Um, interesting um piece of you know digital art i mean why are people paying so much money for it well you know and and that's one way of thinking about it you know another you know but you know when i look at it it's you know i mean and and as you look behind the transaction in terms of mm -hmm. you know what, what people are trying to create is a, a community of people that are interested you know in, in in a particular area and you know the question for the world of nft is you know, many of these NFT communities and art shared artworks that have been created is, you know, will they stand the test of time? Will value mm -hmm. increase over time? Um, you know, my analogy for this is pop art, which, you know, evolved in, in, in the 70s and, and, and 80s. And, you know, if you think about that, you know, you know, probably the most famous pop artist is Andy Warhol and his paintings, you know, you know, you know, 50 years later, even if something as generic as, you know, his famous painting of a can of condensed soup, um, you know, why should that be worth tens of millions of dollars? But it is, you know, mm -hmm. um, because of the brand and the community that was created around his work. You know, most of the pop artists from, you know, that generation are completely gone and completely forgotten. NFTs mm -hmm. as a technology platform, you know, will continue to evolve in terms of the types of experiences they create and communities they enable. That's really interesting. Um, and, and, and obviously Warhol was slammed in his time for, for, for making meaningless work that was not truly yeah. art or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's mean, interesting yeah. you say that there were lots of others who were also doing meaningless art who, in fact, it was meaningless and we do not remember their names or their work. Um, so I guess, I guess, would you have any, you know, without going into investment advice, but, but would you have any tips or frameworks to sort of think about, um, uh, how, how to distinguish between things that do have value and, 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 and maybe that value will stick around versus sort of people who are selling $600,000 digital yachts that are sort of meaningless in the digital space. How do you distinguish between projects that offer the consumer something and, and will have value and, and those that are just sort of empty hype that's fun to buy? Is, is there any way you can think about that? <laughs> um I mean, look. I mean, the, the way I think about it, and and you know, I certainly don't want this to be construed as investment advice at, at all. You know, I, I'm an entrepreneur, which means you know, I'm wrong at least eighty percent of the time. So um, you know, <laughs> I'm a journalist, you know, so it's ninety five for me. <laughs> um, for for me, when I think of you know, I mean, and I, I touched on this earlier on. You know, for me, when I think about you know, digital worlds and and this future of digital, it's you know, you know. 
can you create a community that is you know going to or you know if you invest investing in something are you investing in a community that is going to to create sustainable and ongoing interest from its members you know um, that's you know that's what I think about in terms of any any digital technology. I mean, you know, because you know, as, you know, I mean, the digital world is a world where we can make infinite choices incredibly quickly. I mean, we go to buy, you know, we 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 go to buy something off you know um, you know off our favorite store, and they don't have the the the, our, the hoodie we want to buy in in our size, you know. We just go to the next store. I mean, right. it's incredibly transactional. Um, so you know, for me, yeah, you got to look at you know what's the, you know what's I mean, I call it the power of the community and the power of the experience. You know, and the demand ultimately, you know, you know the 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 demand that's going to be created around that community. You know, we saw you know I mean you know when we saw the evolution of social media, we saw you know we we often talked about the networked effect of social media. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, so, you know, some of those same things apply. I mean, you know, and, and I'm, I mean, of course, you know, I'm, I'm sure that's why Meta is uh, extremely optimistic about, you know, their vision of the, you know, of, of the metaverse, um, because they have a large community, you know, that they've already created and built. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Hey, um, let's jump into some listener questions, because there are a few that have come through. Um, one person asks, jumping off our, our discussion about 2D, um, 3D and, and sort of VR headsets, um, Paul asks, um, do, do you think that everyone will be using VR headsets in the future and it's just a question of, of time and implementation or is it sort of hyped and we will remain in a, in a relatively 2D world? Um, yeah, well, I mean, uh, I mean, so, that, so I think there's a couple of, couple of things in that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, look, I mean, I'm not a hardware expert, um, in, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, as, you know, so I talk about it as a consumer, I talk about it as somebody who's followed, you know, the lack of or the slowness of adoption in this, the, this, you know, in this industry. So, you know, I mean, you know, we, we've been promised, you know, sort of, you know, the, the dream that these headsets will evolve from these large, you know, heavy, bulky, you know, for some people, claustrophobic things to mm -hmm. something more akin to, you know, a pair of glasses that we might wear. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I think, you know, certainly in, in the minds of most people, that's, you know, that's potentially a tipping point, which, you know, we, we, we're still not close to at this point in time. Um, and, and, and it's not clear when we will be, you know, when we will be close to that type of tipping point. Um, so, you know, that, that's, you know, a, an obvious, you know, I think that's a pretty obvious one in terms of, you know, I mean, there are ways and there are technologies which we're increasingly seeing that turn our 2D screens into more immersive, you know, 3D experiences, whether it's, you know, whether it's our smartphones and and the sort of you know the the sort of you know AR you know type experiences of you know Pokemon Go and stuff like that, mm -hmm. um, you know we're we're seeing um, there's some really interesting um, um, screen technology startups that create more immersive you know 3D experiences out of flat t you know flat flat screens which you know me you know, might be where the the, the for, you know, what i call you know you get a hybrid um, metaverse experience so you can walk into your into a real store and you can talk to the same digital assistant that you're talking to at, you know on a big 3D immersive screen um, and the same, you talk to the same digital person that you were talking to on your smartphone at home. So, mm -hmm. okay. So, yeah. Um, so, that, so there are sort of non three D um, possibilities there. Jason asks, what Kiwi value add is being used in your work in the metaverse? Is there a unique Kiwi spin that sets Soul Machine apart from others? Oh wow. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, yes, yes, and no. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, startups are about people. Okay, mm -hmm. so you know, um, and you know, the two founders. Yeah, I mean, so you know, I mean, a, a simple answer is the two co-founders of you know Soul Machines are Kiwis. You know, um, you know, um, you know, me as an entrepreneur and Dr. Mark S Sager as an animate, you know, an animated. Te uh, te technology animator and 
and a, and a, and a researcher and a scientist. So, you know, I mean the fact that you know we we are Kiwis means you know there is something unique about it. You know, I mean we we are both good at what we do because we've spent a lot of time working, you know, you know and um, living in, in you know in very large you know, international markets, you know, um, competing against the best in the world. So there's a lot. There's a lots of factors to it, you know. Um, you know, one of the theories I have, you know, you know, the work we have done, you know, to lead the world in our in our fields of cognitive modeling and embodied cognition, which is you know our expertise in in in, in deep tech research and in AI. You know, one of the reasons, you know, why I believe it ca it came out of a smaller research university like the University of Auckland, as opposed to a Stanford or an MIT. Is you know in smaller universities it's it's you know it's much easier for different for interdisciplinary teams of scientists and researchers like you know Marx if I go back to Marx original research team he had neuroscientists and developmental psychologists all working together all you know collaborating on the same team you know that cross silo collaboration doesn't always happen and you know in, in the you know you know these much larger University. So there's another, if you like, Kiwi flavor to it. Um, I think, you know, um, you know, we, you know, I mean, if, if you think of the the current world of animation that's going on in the movie industry and the games industry, you know, where did digital, you know, another Kiwi company is really setting the standard on the on the world stage or has set the standard on the world stage for the last, you know, with, with the amazing work that, you know, Sir Peter Tap Jackson and Sir Richard Taylor have done over the last 20 years. So, yeah, I think, you know, th there's something to the Kiwi pedigree, I guess. Um, but, you know, we, we only get to do what we do by, you know, by executing and, and be, you know, and, and delivering um, on a day to day basis as well. So, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, I mean you know, um, you know um, we've been very successful in raising capital today. We have some great international backers, but, you know, I mean, you know, um, we've already talked about what happens, you know, um, you know, when, when, you know, when new technologies like, you know, big massive technology shifts like the internet and the metaverse come along. There's a lot of disruption. There's a lot of people that, you know, um, do incredibly well, and the, but there's a, there's a whole lot more that, um, you know, um, become footnotes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Greg, we did talk about this a little bit, but it's the most popular question by far, so I'll, I'll ask it again. Um, how will payments work in the metaverse, and where will cryptocurrencies fit into all this? It's from John K. We did talk about it a little bit. Maybe you could, you could reiterate. Yeah, or um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I payments in the you know in the metaverse. I, I mean, I think they will. Yeah, I mean, my view is they will mirror. Um, Will mirror the, the you know what we have in our current e-commerce stores today. Um, yeah, without a doubt. You know, you know, um, you know more and more you know, cryptocurrencies are being rapidly adopted um, um, by a lot more consumers. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and a lot more of the existing establishment. You know, um, the existing banking infrastructure. You know, I mean, you know, you, you can have a Visa card or a Mastercard today, which enables you to pay in. In a, in a in a you know real world currency or in a cryptocurrency. So you know, I, you know look, I think we'll see all of those. We, you know, will cryptocurrencies rule the the banking? You know, be the only way we pay each other in the future? Um, I'm not smart enough to answer that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not smart That's, enough to answer yeah. that question. I think there's a lot of you know what we're seeing at the moment. You know, you know, you know how you I mean a lot of governments are starting to be. You know, how are we going to regulate this world? How are we going to manage mm -hmm. the, the the financial instruments that exist? In it? And and I mean, as a you know, as a currency, the cryptocurrency is designed to be decentralized and distributed. That's the appeal for most of the early users of it. So, but you know, um, yeah, uh, there's some really big questions in that one still too. Yeah, that's really interesting. If if I were to push your view on that slightly, it almost sounds to me like you're saying, um, you know, the metaverse will only rely on cryptocurrencies if cryptocurrencies are widely used outside of the metaverse the metaverse will just reflect whatever is widely used in general is that almost what you're saying there um yeah yeah i guess i mean yeah i mean i mean yeah i think yeah i mean i, I do think you know by and large the you know because at the end of the day you know these worlds are driven by you know the experiences we want and the technologies we want and the, yeah. I mean, the utility we want as human beings. So, 
you know, so I, I do think, you know, a, a lot will, you know, it does go to the, the real world and the digital world. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I think there's some interesting choices that, you know, we've, you know, I mean, the kids that are growing up today, you know, kids that are growing up today, you know, might not have a job in the real world, you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, you know, um, you, know they, you know, I mean, there, you know, we've already seen, you know, there are kids, you know, today who, um, uh, uh, you know, their, their job is, you know, they've decided they want to be in the NFT business and they, might, they, get, they can make a lot of money being in the NFT business or being a, a, you know, a, a Instagram or TikTok influencer. These are job options. Yeah. So imagine in the future you deciding that, you know, you don't want a job in the real world and you're going to create, you know, digital, you're going to create avatars who, who are going to create value for you in the metaverse. I mean, that's a world that could exist um, in the future. You know, instead of you working, you know, eight hours a day or whatever it is that you do in the, in the real world, you create 10 avatars, you know, who have sp specialist expertise, who other people, you know, you know, buy off you with cryptocurrency um, in the, you know, in the metaverse. Yeah. We've um, talked a lot, a lot about commerce, but there's one question here that, that sort of says outside of, um, outside of consuming and purchasing and, and, um, I guess, yeah, not exactly outside of capitalism, but but outside of that, are, are there lots of opportunities for the metaverse as well? Can you talk about any of them? Are there education opportunities or, uh, yeah. or sort of non-commercial opportunities? Uh, look, uh, look of, of course, you know, the, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, we're already, you know, as a company, you know, that we're most proud of and, you know, in terms of the work that we're doing today um, is work that we're doing, you know, you know, in the healthcare and educational sector, you know, because, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, if, you know, one of the, one of the things that often comes up when we talk about digital people or avatars, you know, and robots is they're going to steal our jobs. Um, now, but the really interesting thing about healthcare and education is we don't have enough workers, you know, we don't exactly have enough right. people in these industries already, you know, um, you know, I, you know, um, you know, despite, 50 years of, you know, pretty much continuous economic prosperity, prosperity um, the standard of education and healthcare in most developed nations has gone backwards, not forwards over yeah. the last 50 years. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, we're all seeing, you know, and that's really, that, that, that debate has really been highlighted in the last two years here in New Zealand. You know, you know I mean, many of the, our government's policy decisions have been driven by the, the standard of our healthcare infrastructure or the underinvestment of our healthcare infrastructure, you know, um, you know um, or the lack of nurses and doctors, you know, and, and the problems that are coming are, are only going to be exacerbated. So, you know, we, we've done a lot of work even in, the, in, in our current digital world, so 2D internet world, you know, where we're working with um, universities like Maryville in, in um, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, Maryville is a, you know, is a traditional um, U.S. college um, university in our context, they have 5,000 students on their campus just outside of St. Louis. Um, but, you know, um, when, that, when we entered the, um, when they entered the COVID pandemic in the US, they had 5,000 um, students on their digital campus. You know, today they have nearly 15,000 students on their wow. digital campus. So that means they, as a university, can offer digital education to students all over the world. You know, um, we, we, we've done projects with a number of big healthcare companies that are looking at ways they can amplify, you know, the, their, their real world um, medical um, personnel using digital people. So, you know, the, the metaverse, you know, takes that, you know, to another level. I mean, you know, think about, you know, um, you know, I mean, a lot of the, the world of medicine is about, um, you know, you know is, is about trying to fix you when something's badly wrong, you know, but yeah. what if you had a digital coach, you know, health coach in the metaverse um, that could yeah. help you, you know, stop smoking or help you, um, you know, lose weight, you know, if you, you know, um, yeah, so these are sort of you know these are some of the sorts of things that 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 we think about in terms of the opportunities to make a difference. I mean, yeah, you know, we talk yeah. about this. We we we, ref, we talk about this as the way in which you can democratize the uh, the uh, access to you know fairly fundamental human services. You know, um, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're hugely excited of the opportunity to make a difference in in the world of 
um, healthcare and education. One of, one of the really interesting things that we found, so you know, imagine having a digital tutor, um, a digital language tutor. Um, mm -hmm. um, Dan, you know, I mean, I went to, you know, we all went to high school, you know, some of us studied French or, or Japanese or maybe Mandarin if you're a bit, bit younger than me at, at our high school here in New Zealand. Um, and, but most of us don't speak the language we learn in high school. And there's a simple reason for that is most of us don't process the syntax of another language really well with our brain. So, you know, about three, three, you know, there'll be in a class of 30, maybe three, three kids just are, are naturals. And the rest of us do enough to, to pass, or some of us do enough to pass the exam and, and, and the rest of us give up and, uh, and, and decide that speaking a foreign language is not for us. A big part of the problem there is peer pressure. You know, you know, we get scared about asking the same question or we feel judged in asking the same question every time, you know, again and again. Now, if you've got a digital, you know, a digital language tutor who, who, who doesn't, judge you because you do the same lesson 10 times or you ask the same question 20 times mm -hmm. you know you, you you can see some of the ways in which you know we can think about changing the, the paradigm um you know in, in important fields like teaching and coaching and um, healthcare. okay amazing hey that's all we have time for greg thank you so much for coming on and talking us through it we are super grateful for that um and thanks everyone else for tuning in we really uh, appreciate you joining us. Please check out Cheersy's daily financial news podcast. It's called Recap. It's around 10 minutes long and is published at 5 p.m. Monday to Friday on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. It is great. Uh, we will see you back here next Thursday for another shared lunch. My colleague Francis Cook is talking to the CEO of Raycon, uh, Sinan Alto. Um, and there's a link to register for that chat right now. Um, so please come back same time next week. Enjoy the rest of your week and stay safe.